Okay, good evening, everyone. And uh, I trust you're able to see uh, my PowerPoint slide there, uh, Brother yeah. Scott? Yeah, looks good. Great. Okay, well, thank you, Brother Scott, for the introductory reading. And uh, good evening. Our topic this tonight is the subject of design versus chance. And it really asks the question is, is our universe the result of chance of probabilities or has it been supernaturally formed by a designer? Is humanity the, the product of a series of, of fortunate accidental circumstances or have we been specifically designed and created by an all-powerful God? Are we here by design or by chance? And as we saw from our, our reading in Job, in scripture, there's a clear declaration that Job told his friends that it was God that created all those things. But some would say, well, science contradicts that. So, so let's take a look at that tonight and, and uh, see what we can, we can find from that. So here's where we're going to be covering tonight. Uh, we're going to consider chance. And in that, we're going to consider probability and proteins. Design is going to be, we're going to take a look at uh, something called irreducible complexity um, and common design. And then we're going to consider the question, does it matter? Does it matter what it was or what we believe? <laughs> so we'll start off with this quote here um, from, from Hen Henry Fuller. So he's a biologist. He wrote this uh, in his book, uh, The Plant World. In, in 1940s. Um, and at that time, he said, the evidence of those who would explain life's origin on the basis of accidental combination of subtle chemical elements, or sorry, suitable chemical elements, is no more tangible than that of those people who place their faith in divine creation as the explanation of the development of life. Obviously, the latter have as much justification for their belief as do the former. So it kind of sounds like he's sitting on the fence. He doesn't say that one has more reason than the other. And I think he goes on to say that that's because, you know, it can't be proven with experiment. Although many have tried to, to prove the sort of spontaneous generation of life, um, they can't prove that. And obviously, uh, creating an experiment to provide uh, the creation of life uh, scientists can't do as well. So the question is, could life be the product of all these chance occurrences of accidents of nature without any plan or purpose as envisioned by the supporters of the theory of evolution? Or was life purpose designed and created by a higher power? So a little bit of full disclosure, I. My day job, I do design on a regular basis, uh, not design of planets or of species, but uh, in engineering design. So I have a natural leaning towards the design side of things, um, but we're going to get into to both the design and the chance. So here's a definition of chance. And this is right out of Merriam-Webster dictionary. And you'll, you'll note that it's a noun, which uh, means it's thing it's not it's not an actual action that anyone does so it's something that happens unpredictably without discernible human intention or observable cause and the example the dictionary gives is which cards you are dealt is simply a matter of chance so there's 52 cards in the deck if you're playing without jokers and you're going to get one of those 52 cards uh, if you're, you're dealt a particular a particular card So now a uh, time for a bit of uh, a math refresher on probability. Some of you may have recall this from, uh, from high school days. Um, so using probability theory, it is possible to tell how likely it is for something to happen. So some of you will be aware that if you flip a coin, you have an option of heads or tails. And 
you have a one out of two chance or a 50% chance that you're going to get heads or tails. And if you're trying to get heads, most of the times, if you flip it twice, uh, the probability is that you'll at least get heads once. So let's say you take 10 coins and you flip them a thousand times each. Well, probability tells us that about similarly, half the flips will turn up heads and about half will turn up tails. But how many times would you have to flip the coins for all 10 to turn up heads at the exact same time? Well, if we do the math, well, for every time that we do a coin flip, we have two options. That means that we have uh, to the power of 10 uh, times that it's going to, to take on average to get all heads. So that's gonna be a thousand times that we're gonna to have to flip those coins. Um, so that's a, that's a fair bit of coin flipping to get all heads. Now that's pretty straightforward because coins only have two sides. What about dice? So dice, if you're using sort of a standard six-sided dice, not one of those multi-sided ones that some of you uh, gamers play with, um, but a six-sided dice, how many times does that need to be rolled, all 10 dice, for all of them to come up to be a particular number, say the number one? Well, similar math. This time, six to the power of 10. This works out to just over 60 million. So you can see the when you have more variables, uh, it goes up quite significantly. So if you rolled those dice twice every minute for 10 hours each day, it would take you 138 years of rolling the dice to be sure that all 10 die would turn up with the same number one on it. So that's a little bit of an intro to probability. Now, when we go look at biology, there's things called amino acids. And these are some of the smallest building blocks of life. We're talking at the molecular level here. Uh, they contain hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, et cetera. <laughs> so they're very, very, very small. And there's 20 kinds of amino acids uh, in various combinations that, that make up our body. So 20, that doesn't sound like too many, um, but those get joined together to make proteins and proteins are essential for life. So as you can see in this, this uh, image on the screen here, there's 20 kinds of, of amino acids and they join together to make these chains or these uh, various configurations. Some of them are nice and, and straight and some of them get a lot more complicated. But the average protein in the, in the smallest known living thing has about 40, no, or, sorry, 400 known amino acid links. So that link of all those little uh, dots on your screen would be 400 links long. And each link must be in the right order. It's something like uh, the alphabet. We've got 26 letters in our alphabet. To make words, the letters must be in a particular order to make a meaningful word. And if they're mixed up, then it doesn't make the word you're intending. And usually, uh, if you've played Scrabble, you get a pile of letters and it doesn't make the words you want anyways. So even these smallest proteins are 400 links or 400 letters long. Some proteins uh, are smaller. 50 is sort of considered a small, uh, a small protein, but some are up to 50,000 amino acids all linked together. And they must all be in the right order to make that protein work. So if we take on the very conservative side, the smallest protein, so a small protein of 50 links long. Well, what's the probability of an amino acid chain 50 units long happening by chance? So let's say we had a, um, a, a big bowl of all these amino acids, these 
20 different kinds, but it's got hundreds of thousands of them sitting in it. This is what uh, many evolutionists would call a, a primeval soup. So it has all of the building blocks and it's just waiting for them to, to join together. So to make one 50 units long, that makes the actual protein that is required, um, whatever that protein is. So it might be a protein to make the, the wall of a cell, or it might be something that transports something in a cell. Um, to make it 50 units long, the answer is then you take the number of variables, which is the 20, and you make that to the power of 50, because that's how many different items we have. So when you do that math, it works out to 10 followed by 65 zeros. So no one chance in a million would be 10 followed by five zeros. So this is an extremely uh, low probability uh, occurrence. To put it in context, let's say there was going to be an attempt at connecting these amino acids together every second. Every single second, there is an attempt to connect the amino acids together to make this protein. Well, there's a little over 31 million seconds in a year. And if I take the, the number of chances that are required for this protein to happen, which is 10 with 65 zeros after it, divided by that number of seconds, I still need 10 with 57 zeros after it in years. So to put that in context, evolutionists speak in terms of billions of years. So that's one with nine zeros after it. So we're talking significantly more time required if this is attempted every second of every day for billions and billions of years. That's the... Uh, the chances of this happening. Now, that is to create one protein. So how many proteins are in a cell? Well, this actually just came out in, in uh, January of 2018. <laughs> there are some, some scientists, um, have, well, I'll, I'll read the, the quote here. Scientists have finally put their finger on how many protein molecules there are in a cell, ending decades of guesswork in clearing the way for further research on how protein abundance affects the health of an organ organism. So they go on to say that there's some 42 million protein molecules. So that's the molecules, that's not the actual proteins themselves um, in a simple cell. And this was actually done uh, quite close to here. This was done at the University of Toronto. Um, a team of researchers led by uh, Grant Brown, a biochemistry professor, um, they did this research and it was funded by the Canadian Cancer Society because um, excessive amounts of proteins um, are indicators uh, related to cancer. So they wanted to figure out, okay, well, how, how many are we talking here? And they weren't able to use uh, human cells to count because they don't have enough information. There's, there's just too much information about the human cell. So they used something that is a lot simpler. They used a yeast cell. So a yeast cell, they say, contains 6,000 proteins. So we were talking about creating one protein, a mere 50 uh, amino acids long and how long it would take for that to happen by probability. Well, a single yeast cell contains 6,000 proteins and Brown and his colleagues went through the, the task of trying to find out how many molecules are in there. And they said that, you know, some have very few, they're really short proteins and some are really long. And on the average, uh, most proteins uh, in the yeast cell contain between 1,000 and 10,000 molecules. So for one yeast cell, there's 42 million protein molecules that make up that cell. Um, so for all of those to be in the right spot to 
achieve what is required is uh, is a pretty daunting uh, thing if you start looking at the probabilities uh, to go along with that. <laughs> Sir Fred Hoyle, who he's a English or he was an English astronomer, and he uh, he says here. The chance of getting even the simplest enzymes of life by chance, even in billions and billions of years, would be impossible. To get those combinations mathematically put together, he calculated, would be a 1 in 10 to the minus 40,000. He says that's no chance. It's impossible. Now, Sir Fred Hoyle doesn't believe in creation. He's not a creationist. He actually um, was a as an astronomer in, in the UK, he formulated a theory called stellular nucleosynthesis. Um, and he's the one actually who coined the term Big Bang. Uh, so the Big Bang theory is uh, Sir Fred Hoyle's uh, terminology that he used on a radio program. And he was not in support of it. He was actually uh, speaking against it in an interview, um, but he didn't believe in creation. Uh, but he couldn't justify uh, the Big Bang theory or some sort of uh, chance occurrence of life happening because he didn't see the math of it working. So faith is, is required to believe in chance. Like based on those probabilities, um, I would say more so than to believe in any sort of design because you have to ignore the facts of the math and the probability of it happening. Now, I do ask you the question, what is the probability if I give you 10 coins of you placing them all heads up? You don't need to flip them. You just put them how you think they should go. Well, most of you would probably get it 100% right. Similarly, what about the 10 dice? Well, if I asked you to do that, you would probably all get that 100% right. So isn't it interesting that highly intelligent scientists have spent their entire lives in a lab trying to create life just to show that no intelligence was necessary in the first place? The writer to the Hebrews says, by faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made of, out of things that are visible. Clearly, the writer to the Hebrews knows that there was so much more to the things that we see that is taken care of in the creative work. So we'll move on to, to design. <laughs> the, the, the definition of the design in, in the dictionary is, is a verb, which doesn't surprise you. It's an action to, to create, to fashion, to execute, or to construct according to a plan. And the, the example that the dictionary gives is to, to design a system for, for doing whatever, for tracking inventory. One of the examples that we can look at for for design is something called irreducible complexity. And this is uh, not specific to creationism. This can happen in, in anything, um, and we'll take a look at that. It's the term applied to a structure or mechanism that requires several precise parts to be assembled simultaneously for there to be a useful function for that structure or mechanism. And Although this isn't the terminology that was used, Darwin, a real uh, Charles Darwin, who who was kind of the the forefather of um, of evolution, said, "If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down." but I can find out no such case. So he, he claims that there wasn't really a case that, that could be had um, 
mind you, we're going to go through some that I think uh, might contradict that. So what's an example of irreducible complexity? <laughs> now I'm going to stick a little bit more to more of a strength of mine and that that's structural engineering and maybe something a little bit easier for all of us to envision. It's well known in, in engineering that an arch structure is an irreducible structure. An arch needs the right components, such as all the, the various wedged elements, the right shapes. Um, and of course it needs the keystone, that, that key uh, piece in the top to be in place for it to work. If those aren't all in place, uh, the, the arch structure wouldn't work. You can't build half of an arch and then it would remain standing while the rest of the arch is developed over time. So much so that when uh, someone is building an arch, they typically put temporary supports to, to support it during, the, uh, during construction. So here's an example of an arch just over a doorway. And you can see all the various wedge stones and you can actually see numbers on them. Um, and because they all have to go in very specific locations. And the formwork that's under the arch is temporarily supporting all the individual stones until they're all in place. And once they're all in place, um, then the support work can be moved out from it um, and it'll be self-supporting. But without that support work, uh, the forces of gravity acting on all those individual stones uh, will make it so that it cannot perform its intended function. So the human foot is actually an arch. As many of you know, you have an arch in your foot. And it's very equivalent in how it works to uh, a man-made arch. And this is just one clear example of irreducible complexity. Human feet have a unique arc, arch structure that is completely different uh, from the flat feet of, of apes. And arch feet are very important for the upright stature of, of human beings because they allow fine control of the position of the body over the feet. When standing upright, a person can maintain balance by adjusting the relative pressures on the heels and the balls of their feet. With that, uh, that arch between the ball and the heel, as you can see in that, that image, um, the human foot has 26 precisely shaped bones together with many ligaments, tendons, and muscles. And several of those bones are actually wedge shaped so that a strong arch is formed. There are several parts in the foot that must be in place and correctly designed before the foot, foot can function properly. In other words, the human foot cannot evolve step by step from a non-arched structure like a hand. An arch needs the, all the right components, like the wedge-shaped blocks, like the keystone, to be in place to work as, in, uh, as intended. And since the human foot has parts equivalent to a keystone and those wedge-shaped blocks, the human foot must be considered an irreducible structure. Only an intelligent designer has the ability to think ahead and plan all the features needed to make an arch like the foot. The arch structure of the human foot is a perfect design for giving humans upright mobility. In contrast to humans, apes have very flexible feet that are effectively a second pair of hands for gripping branches. In consequence, apes have very limited ability for two-legged standing, walking, and running. They can do it, but not for extended periods of time. No different than some of us, my daughter included, can stand on their hands for some period of time, um, but not for long periods of time. It's interesting, this actually comes up in scripture. In Daniel, <laughs> there's a comparison made between the beasts that Daniel sees in Daniel chapter seven. And he's told the first 
or we're told that the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. So not only the, the standing like a man, but also the mind of a man are two differentiators from beasts that we see in, in scripture. Similarly, uh, Paul, uh, Jesus says to him at his conversion, he says, rise and stand on your feet for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to appoint you as a service, a servant and witness to the things which you have seen me and to those which I will appear to you. Man had intentionally been given this ability to stand upright. And we see that the term to, to stand up uh, coming up a number of times in, in scripture. So what's another irreducible uh, complexity that we have? Well, the eye has become a, a red flag for, for many who be believe in evolution because there's no sign of evolution of any kind when, when the eye is concerned. There's numerous, many, many animals that, that have, uh, have eyes, but wherever, wherever you look, either in modern day or in the fossil records, they all have fully developed functional eyes. Does this look like something that could occur by random chance or is design required? With all the various components that are here, just the ones that are labeled on the screen, and this is a very simplified schematic of, of the eye. What, if some of these weren't there, what would a portion of these serve to justify keeping as part of natural selection? Evolution would tell you that, well, if something wasn't useful, it would eventually not get used. But for an eye to develop, all these things would have to come to be at the same time. And they would have to be kept while other items are being developed. This is an all or nothing organ. And, and Charles Darwin actually agrees um, Here's a quote from, from, from Charles Darwin. He says, to suppose the eye with all its imitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. So that's Charles Darwin comments on the actual chances of the eye uh, being borne out by, by evolution. He considers it absurd to the highest possible degree. And what do we read of in scripture? Well, the, the Bible clearly indicates who the designer is. He says, the psalmist says, understand ye brutish among the people and ye fools. When will you be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? And likewise in Proverbs, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. And we're not going to look at it, but this proverb is a perfect example of the divine record telling us what to use. The ear and the eye are two, two things that are part of our body that we all have that have so many parts in them that are required that they are irreducibly complex. The ear cannot function without all the various parts it has, and similarly the eye. And in Proverbs 20, it's clear that uh, the divine record is telling us, look at these items. These are clearly made by your heavenly father. So the other thing we want to look at with regard to uh, design is something called common design. And this is where the same design solution is used in different situations by a common designer. And this isn't uh, reserved just for creation. Human designers use this all the time. They, they carry out 
common design because it's, it represents good design practice. So for example, if a designer wants to select the same type of connection method for joining two parts together um, in different products, such as bicycles and cars or a spacecraft, because this is the best design solution in each case. So let's say we have a connection and they say, you know what, we should use uh, uh, bolts with a nut on it and some washers. That is the most appropriate connection for, for this situation. Well, you might find that on a bicycle. Well, you might also find that on a car because it's a, similarly, it's a, an appropriate solution um, and it makes the most sense. This is not evidence of evolution, but it's evidence of the careful work of a designer that sees the same uh, solution for a similar problem. So this comes up when we take a look at a tree. So this tree here is actually an evolutionary tree. This is, you may find in a, in a science textbook, um, there's numerous versions of it because unfortunately they're not very uh, consistent. They're not, they're not, uh, there's not an one evolutionary tree. There's a lot of dispute as to what an evolutionary tree looks like. <laughs> so I pulled this one up and I started looking at it and said, okay, well, well, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense? And this is just looking at the characteristics of these various, um, these various species that are listed on the tree. So I've circled a couple there, uh, the mollusks, starfish and birds. And what I want to take a look at is, so um, mollusks, those are that's like clams, oysters, snails, uh, octopus, things like that. Um, so they come off on a branch before starfish. And, and mollusks um, like octopi have uh, a three chambered heart and a cardiovascular system. So they've got a, a blood, a blood system to, to pump the blood through, through their body. Whereas a starfish, which comes off later in the evolutionary tree, um, actually has no brains, no blood or a central nervous system, but they do have eyes, but their eyes are in the ends of their arms. And if a predator eats one of those arms, it can regenerate. So how do we see uh, a starfish coming out from something that did have blood and a heart to higher up in the tree to not have blood or a heart or even uh, a discernible brain? The mollusks, on the other hand, have uh, or octopus um, have numerous types of eyes. Um, so we see mollusks having eyes, uh, some of them multiple, more than, uh, more than two, more than four. Some of them have 20 plus eyes. Starfish have them in the ends of their arms. And then uh, the rest of the, uh, the ones that you would sort of consider normally, like the marsupials and the humans and the other uh, land animals that have eyes typically have two eyes. So how did we go from, from mollusks that had 24 eyes to starfish having eyes in the ends of their arms and then humans having two eyes? It would seem as though that the eyes uh, had to form numerous times. So not only is the eye uh, incredibly complex, uh, it had to be it had to evolve multiple times in the evolutionary tree. Oh, and I forgot to put up my, my fancy pictures of the uh, starfish and the octopus. The other one that we want to take a look at is the hummingbird. So birds you'll see on the, on the list there come up, uh, they spring out of a branch near the crocodiles, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, there's lots of different types of birds, but there's only one little, uh, one little twig on this branch for birds. But a hummingbird's very unique. Um, as many of you are aware, it, it's unlike any of the other birds. The way its wings work are very different. Its, its heart is incredibly different. 
So when I take a look at this uh, evolutionary tree, you would think that a number of the characteristics would be similar. Well, a hummingbird, although it's significantly smaller than a crocodile, um, has a much bigger heart than a crocodile in comparison. Actually, a hummingbird's heart makes up uh, two to two and a half percent, uh, depending on the type of hummingbird, uh, of the hummingbird's total weight. So this makes the hummingbird's heart, relatively speaking, the largest heart in the animal kingdom. So uh, it, if you were to have a big heart, you would be a hummingbird. Um, a hummingbird's heart beats about 250 beats per minute at rest and about 1200 beats per minute when flying. So this is drastically different than the crocodiles and the iguanas uh, that it is uh, said to come from. The other one I wanna point out are jellyfish. Um, don't have that, uh, you'll see it just below the mollusks there. And uh, jellyfish um, circled down in the, uh, the bottom, it sort of has some things that, that come up before uh, sort of lists characteristics. So where the jellyfish are, it says organs. And then after that, it, uh, it talks about the, uh, the nervous and, and the vascular system, I believe is what it says. Um, but jellyfish have eyes, but they came before the nervous system uh, is listed on this particular tree. So it's a little bit hard to have eyes without a way to signal those eyes. Um, to send the signals to, to the brain. So the eyes seen in very different types of creatures, mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles. <laughs> and in each case, there are special light sensitive cells, nerve pathways for conveying those signals to the brain and a part of the brain for processing the signals. Um, in addition, there, there's usually some form of lens for directing the light onto the, the light sensing cells. Uh, there's also, clear cells. So the front of our eyes have to be specially, uh, they can't be opaque or else everything else doesn't work. Um, when you consider the, the great differences between different classes of creatures, it's remarkable how the eye for each creature is so similar in, in design. The, the similarity in design is just what would be expected from a common designer, because you would know the best solution for, for each case. So there's some other conflicts in the, the evolutionary tree of life, as they call it. So this is an article um, here in an, from uh, a magazine called New Scientist. And it says that uh, Darwin was wrong uh, cutting down the, the tree of life. And when, when fossils failed to demonstrate that animals evolved from a common ancestor because they couldn't find all those links, uh, evolutionary scientists started to turn to other types of science. So DNA sequencing came to be uh, starting in like the 1960s when they started uh, getting into the genetic code and that was start, first starting to be understood. And there's a couple of biochemists who hypothesized that if DNA sequences could be used to produce evolutionary trees, trees that match those based on the anatomical characteristics, then, then they would have found uh, everything that they needed. But unfortunately, um, this article that was written in 2009 says that the problems began in the early 1990s when it became possible to sequence actual bacterial and archaeal genes rather than just RNA. Everybody expected these DNA, DNA sequences to confirm the RNA tree. And sometimes they did, but crucially, sometimes they did not. RNA, for example, might suggest that species A was more closely related to species B than species C, but a tree made from DNA would suggest the reverse. So as you can see, this would cause some, uh, some major problems for, for the scientists to try to figure out, well, which tree do I create? Which, which species is 
is it related to? Do I follow the DNA sequencing or do I follow the RNA? Well, that's probably because when you have a common designer, there's, there's some various parts that are, are similar that would uh, lead someone to believe that they're, they might be uh, related, um, but they're related because they're related by the same designer, not because one uh, came out of the other one. They go on to say that for a long time, the Holy Grail was to build a tree of life. But today, the project lies in tatters, torn in pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. So unfortunately, one assumption that these uh, biologists aren't willing to reevaluate is the assumption that, they, that there's a universal common ancestor. They assume it's all coming from the base of the tree and everything's coming out from there. But rather, they go for an ad hoc of our arguments. Uh, horizontal gene transfer, long branch, attraction, rapid evolution, different rates of evolution, incomplete sampling, flawed methodology, uh, all these various things to try to explain away inconvenient data which doesn't fit uh, the coveted single source um, ancestor for the, the tree pattern. Um, at the end of the day, the dream that DNA sequence data would fit into a nice neat tree of life has failed and with it a key prediction of Dar Darwinian theory. So this evening we went through a, a few of the many items that could be considered as part of design and creation. There's, there's others we could, could look at. Um, but since it's true that neither evolution or creation can be proved scientifically by a reenactment of an experiment, does it really matter which view one takes? Well, this professor says, the doctrine of evolution, if consistently accepted, makes it impossible to believe the Bible. Some would say that there is a theistic evolution that you could, could believe, where God created the first life and allowed it to, to evolve from there. But that also contradicts scripture. And as Professor Huxley says, if you follow that through, it's impossible to believe the Bible. So the choice is between two philosophies, really. The divine philosophy of a positive purpose for life and an atheistic one, which is survival of the fittest, every man for himself, and no plan or purpose. The end result is, what is the purpose of life? And also the purpose of the designer that created it. And Paul teaches us about, about God the creator in Romans chapter one. He says, for the invisible things, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So Paul says there are invisible things that, that God has, things that we can't see with our eyes. But based on the creation, we can clearly see many of the things that God has in store. It's important to keep in mind that, that the faith of a believer is, is not blind faith. God has left his fingerprints and his hallmarks on his creation so that his existence and, and attributes are clear for all to see. But we know that, that faith is important, not necessarily faith in the creation, but we're told that without faith, it is impossible to please him. As we read earlier tonight, the words of Job to his friends, he says, but ask now the beasts and they shall teach thee and the fowls of the air and they shall tell thee or speak to the earth and it shall teach thee and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not all these things that the hand of the Lord hath wrought us? And whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? So Job tells his friends, just look, go talk to it. The animals 
Go look at them. Go look at the birds, at the fish. They all declare his handiwork. Isaiah says the same thing. He says, for all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But he goes on to say, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. So God says, yes, I've made all these things. My hands have made all these things. But really what I'm looking to is him who is of a poor and contrite spirit and trembles at my word. It's clear that the natural creation was just a shadow of his great work he's accomplishing in each and every one of us to his glory. Ultimately, we are his creation. For he says, we're told in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 